Hey guys, welcome to the first video of my photogrammetry series. So there are a lot of information online like on YouTube covering how to do photogrammetry and there are bazillions of ways to do photogrammetry, but I find most of these videos flawed in some way. They're always something that they could have done a lot better and I've tried to streamline and perfect my process to overcome that. Because usually, I mean, you want to have some high quality scans, obviously, but it's also important to be time efficient. You have to be do you have to be able to produce it fairly fast with the high quality. And I found out that you don't have to choose between quality and speed. You just have to do it the right way. And for those of you who don't know, what is photogrammetry? Well, photogrammetry is when you shoot an object in a, in a load of different angles, and then you have a software to calculate the 3D data out of that by combining the angles and comparing them to each other. There are a bunch of different programs to use. You can have like the free versions like uh, Autodesk 123D, which is cloud-based, or you can have uh, the more professional ones, Agisoft Metashape or Reality Capture. And I will actually focus on the professional ones because I, you know, I don't see a point of using the cloud-based, cheaper, simpler, or the free versions of softwares in this case, because what we are looking for is quality. And throughout this series, I will go through both programs, Agisoft and Reality Capture. And why I will do that is not only, you know, partly because that was part of my own process, my development process. I started in one end, I ended up in the other, and I want to show you that process, uh, but also because I want you to be able to make your own decisions because the one program is not necessarily better than the other, and it's good for you to know the differences of them and to be able to make up your own mind of what you want to use. So in this series, I will go through um, basically from start to finish, where I started doing photogrammetry and where most people do it, basically with a phone and just walking outside and scanning things. And I will go through it step by step to the point where I am today and also go through all the things that I've learned through this process. And there are a lot of questions that we have to cover along the way. And like, do I need like 500 images or can I do with 50? Do I need uh, like a 35 millimeter or can I use an 80 millimeter? Do I need prime lenses or zoom lenses? Do I need tripods? Do I need special lighting like soft boxes and stuff? What is cross polarization and do I need it? Do I have to spend a fortune on gear? And stuff like that. To quickly answer the last question, no, you don't have to spend a fortune on gear, but if you do, you will get better results. The quality is a direct result of what gear you're using. So without further ado, let's begin. So this would be a very common place to start when you don't have any specific gear. You would walk outside and just start shooting with your phone. Like this, in all different kinds of angles, and up and down. And there are a couple of problems with this. So you are very depending actually on the lighting because you don't want to have sunlight. Because when you're doing photogrammetry, you want to have your model unlit basically. You don't want to have any lighting on it. And right now, if I would capture this right now, I would get the sunlight and the shadows baked into the texture. So shooting outside, you are very weather dependent. And another issue is that even though phones are actually really good today, they're not really good enough. So if you're not going to shoot with your phone, then what should you use? Well, obviously a real camera and current... Oh, Jesus. Cur I'm, I'm having a mirror here just to show you because I can't film it. Currently, I am using a Sony a7R3. Um, anyway, so the question is, do you need such an expensive camera? Well, no, you don't. But also, you know how they say that megapixels don't really matter? Well, in this case, it actually does. Because the higher resolution images you can get, the more 3D details you can have, and also the bigger resolution textures you can get out of your scans. So yeah, you can absolutely use a cheaper camera, and you can get amazing results out of that too. 
but just bear in mind that it does affect the quality. So what about lenses? You have prime lenses, you have zoom lenses, you have wide angle, you have tele lenses. What is the best choice for photogrammetry? Well, I've basically tried them all. Here's an 80 millimeter, 18 millimeter. Here's a 50 millimeter macro. Here's a 35 millimeter, 85 millimeter, 28 to 75 zoom lens, a 100 millimeter macro, and a 105 millimeter. Actually, I haven't used this. I just uh, I, I wanted to show it because it's it's so. Anyway, uh, don't use that. What is the best choice? I have realized by trying them all that it doesn't really matter. What I have learned though is that it does actually affect the depth of field because if you use a, a lens with a smaller field of view, like the 50 millimeter, you will actually have shorter depth of field. But what you want to have when you're doing photogrammetry is you want to have as much depth as possible so you don't want to have any blur on the object you're shooting. So if you like shooting from up here, you're focusing on this part, you don't want to have this part blurred um, because that will ruin your textures or make it a lot harder for you to, to you know, work the data. So you want to have a lens with as high aperture number as possible. Some of them are like 18, some of them go to like aperture 22. So you wanna have as high as possible so you can uh, get as, as long depth of field as possible. So you can use whatever you want really. You will get some different trades from different kinds of lenses. Like for this example, I get really, really sharp images, but I can't get close. With this, I can get close, I get really sharp images because it's a prime lens, but I will have issues with depth of field being more blurred than the others. And with this one, for example, I can get really close, I can get good depth of field, but I am getting a little bit worse sharpness. So, some of these three, I use that one. Use whatever you want. So my next step is to move inside, and how do you easiest shoot your objects in all different kinds of directions while being inside? You can't just move around the object. So, yeah, I got some kind of simple lazy susan this is just some kind of ikea table rotary table you can move it around so basically you can take a picture you can move it around take another picture move it around and you do it like that and then you move the camera so you get a higher position and then do the same thing all over so you get 360 degrees in different heights um but there's still one more problem because right now i'm having the Aperture is set to 2.8, which is too low because I will get a lot of depth of field. So I have to change that to as high as possible, which means that I will have to lower, sorry, I'm, not, I'm aiming wrong, which means that I will have to lower the exposure time. And here we have, I need to go down to like two and a half seconds. You don't want to crank up the ISO because you don't want to induce noise in the images. So keep ISO as low as possible, aperture as small as possible or in this case as high a number as possible and then you only have the shutter speed to play with which means they will have to go really high so to be able to capture this now i will have to shoot it for two and a half seconds per image like that so you can imagine this takes a long time to move shoot the image move you get the point so how could i speed up this process because we have one more problem here and that is the lighting we have this ugly yellow lighting in here uh, also actually we have shadows which you don't want to have so we can solve both the shutter speed issue and the lighting issue pretty easily and that's to get a, a flash so here's the solution ring flash now this is the Godox AR400, which is a ring flash, which, please bear this in mind, there is a difference between ring flashes and ring lights. Now this one has a real strobe flash inside of it, so you get really powerful light. Now, you, there are other LEDs, like LED lights as well, which kind of fill the same purpose. You place the camera here and you get the light from directly from the camera, so you, get, you will 
basically remove all the shadows on the object. To that extent, they do the same job. But please bear in mind that the LED lights, they're not very strong. So you will still have to stop this table between each photo. And I'll come back to that, but it is important. Also, I would suggest that you get one of these. It's a quick release from Manfrotto that you place here. So that way you don't have to screw the camera on and off all the time when you're removing it. So here's that quick release in place. And all I have to do is to place the camera and click it on. And there it sits, like that. Now you can adjust here, these knobs will adjust um, the height of this so you can get the lens centered. Now I have to tell you though, this flash, Godox has discontinued it. And I've noticed that it, it's actually really hard to get a this kind of flash right now. You can, there's like these Elinchrome uh, flashes, which are like, I don't know, two or three times the price. So this one is really, really affordable and it is discontinued and they have not replaced it with a new model. So if you want this flash and you can find it anywhere, buy it before anyone else buys it first because you will, you will not get hold of these. So all I have to do now is to connect the flash to the camera. So I have the sync, sync, PC sync cable there and just plug it in. And on this side, I have the 35 millimeter, uh, the 3.5 millimeter, just audio jack. You can have a piece of sync as well if you have that kind of cable. So I just turned this on. Now I have f22, so the highest possible with this lens, ISO 100, and the shutter speed 1 uh, 125th of a second. So if I click this now, did I get focus on that one? Yeah. You can see that we have basically no visible shadows on the object. So the lighting issue and the long shutter speed issue is solved. So now we have another problem, or I mean, we had before too, but we haven't solved it until now. And that is that the principles of photogrammetry is that you walk around the object and the difference between angles, it can, it can compare them and by that read depth data and generate a 3D model out of that. The problem right now is that we are having the camera fixed. So even if we rotate the object, the wall in the background is not moving. And you will not trick the programs. It'll focus on the wall and it'll be totally impossible to align this point cloud. There are a couple of solutions to this. Like in MetaShape, for example, you can add, you can paint your own masks around the object, which takes a lot of time if you're gonna do that on 300 images. Another way is that you can remove the object and you can take a photo of the background like this, and then you add the object and the program can itself find, you know, it, it can auto mask the object because it compares with the empty one and it knows what is background and what is object. So that way, that's a workaround. But it's not very efficient, it's not very accurate. I mean, you can get good results of it, but I don't trust it. So the best way we can do is to totally get rid of the background. So here was my solution to this problem. I bought a photo tent, pretty big one. But these come with a background as well, completely black fabric. So I'm not only solving, kind of solving the background issue, but I'm also adding some light because the light from the flash will bounce in these sides here and I will have some light coming from the sides of the object because when you have the light only from the front you will get these kind of dark outlines or shadows on the edges of the object because the light is, is coming from you know such a steep angle while here these walls kind of helps um, illuminating the object from the side and from the top a little bit. Not very much, but a little. So if I shoot this now, there is not a lot of features in the background anymore for the program to stick to. And this way it's a lot easier for you to trick the program that the camera is actually moving around the object. It's not perfect. If I zoom in here, I can, you can still see some textures in the background here, so it's not perfect. Uh, but you can, in this case, go into Photoshop. If you're shooting RAW especially, always shoot RAW. If you go into Photoshop or Camera RAW, 
you can just remove the blacks a little bit so you you uh you make this background a little bit darker there is however another solution and we will come to that in a bit but for now there is another problem i want to solve because i still have to move this table click move click and that takes a lot of time i don't want to do that so let's figure that out as well I'm giving you guys such an easy ride right now because all these problems that I'm solving right now step by step has taken me months to do. And the problem with many like YouTube videos and stuff covering photogrammetry is that they, they don't actually go through these problems. So even though they can give you the final solution, you won't learn why you had to take care or why you had to think about these things from the beginning. So anyway, let's move on. So to solve this issue with, with uh, this really time consuming process, I got myself a rotary table, a motorized rotary table. I just click this button and it starts to rotate. Now this in particular is making one circle every 32 seconds and you want to pay attention to how fast they go. Another thing that you can you can keep in mind, if you go out and Google for these, you will find these tables that are actually made for photography. So you, they have like a like a camera trigger built in, so they move a little bit and then they stop, trigger the camera, and then they move a little bit, stop, trigger the camera. And by having one of those, you can easily use a ring LED, ring light, instead of a flash, because you can still have long shutter times. And that is totally okay. You will get good results out of that. But however, I think it takes too long. I want to be time efficient, so I don't want to wait for that, that to stop and then having several seconds of shutter speed. So by having a table like this that never stops and having a real ring flash, I can shoot these while it's moving like that. You can see that I still get sharp images. Thanks to the real flash, the strobe, I never have to stop the table. Really time efficient. Now the trick here to make this really time efficient is to use the built-in time-lapse feature in the camera. Depending on what camera you have, it might or might not have such a feature uh, and it might be named differently. In the Sony a7, I have something called interval shooting. So if I, I can click that, I can turn it on I can set the interval to one second, so it's one second between each shot. And because I know that this table takes 32 seconds to go one full uh, circle, I set the number of shots to 32. And now, when I start shooting, it'll just shoot all the images for me. I don't have to do anything. So now we are getting somewhere. Now this is actually becoming efficient. However, now we have another problem, and I could show this to you in, in, in the computer, but I, I don't want to waste your time doing it. I can just explain it, basically. So what we have now, if I look at this image, we have this object, which is pretty easy to track, you know, figure out. So this would work pretty well. But let's say I would have an object like this, that is... There's no apparent features they can track. It's just one circular shape. So the programs would have a really hard time figure, you know, aligning these images because now you have no features to track on the wall. You have no features to track on the table. The only features it can track on to align the images is the object itself. And now you have some texture, obviously, but that is not always enough. There is a couple of solutions. One would be that you can go in in the photos afterwards and manually mark control points, um, which in this case is pretty hard. You have some kind of spots like here that you can add control points on to help it align the images, but that is also manual work and you want to cut out all the manual work you can. So there is an another thing that I tried. So in order to get some more patterns for the program to be able to um, to use to, to align the camera's position in relation to the object, I tried printing out a cow pattern. So this is just something I find found on Google. I just searched for different kinds of patterns 
and I found a YouTube channel that recommended a cow pattern. So I found this on Google. I printed out on two pieces of paper and just taped them together like this. Also, I added some lines with a ruler here and some circles to be able to easier find the center of the of the table, so the object wouldn't, wouldn't the object wouldn't like rotate around like this. Uh, also, I added some random letters and numbers around here to have additionally some more data for the programs to track and figure out the camera's position. So I just put it on here, put the object there, you know if I shoot that, we'll now see that I have a lot of features for the program to track and figure out the position of the cameras. However, now there is one more thing that I want to solve before um, before going into Agisoft and Reality Capture to generate this mesh. And that is reflections. Now reflections is a real problem when it comes to photogrammetry scanning because if you have an object that reflects a little bit, like the flash or the surroundings, you will have some really hard time aligning the images and figure out the, the shape because a reflection the program will believe that the reflection is part of the shape, even if it's not. And then when the reflection moves, it'll get confused and you will not get a proper mesh. So it's really important to be able to remove reflections. And there is one way to do that, and that is called cross-polarization. I'll give my best shot at explaining cross-polarization. I don't know much about it myself. Um, and there might be some fact issues in my explanation, but I will try my best. So basically, when you have a light source, what I do know is that light is electromagnetic waves. And light is traveling, these waves are traveling like this, in all kinds of directions. And this is basically, um, I don't know if you can call this a polarization, but it is a direction at least. So. When you have a light source, you have a surface, you have a camera. So when the light is leaving the light source, it is going in all kinds of directions, just like here. And then when it's hitting the surface, it is getting polarized by the surface. So meaning that maybe the blue waves in this case, waves that are going in one direction are filtered out partly. So that means that the light that is coming into the camera is already partly polarized. So if you have a polarization filter, just a glass filter that basically allows light from one direction to travel through, but it blocks the light from the other direction, then you can remove reflections because the, the light that is coming from the, that reflection is polarized in a certain way that it cannot travel through this lens. However, a surface is usually never fully polarized. So that's why we I have to I have to draw this again. So that's why we have to add a polarization filter to the light source as well. So the polarization here from this light is polarized in one direction. And then when it comes back to the light here, we can filter out everything but that direction. Something like that. Here are an illustration that shows what a, what a polarization filter does. Basically, it blocks the light from um, certain angles to travel through and only letting through light from one certain angle. So that's also why we will get a lot darker result when we are having polarization filters because a lot of the light is just not coming through. So here I have the polarization film and I printed like a holder for that, that I can put on the flash. If you don't have the possibility to print this, I've shared this file for free. So if you have a 3D printer, you can print this one. If you don't have it, uh, you can just basically cut this film manually and just tape it in front of the flash right here. So now I'll just place this on my flash. And now I made sure that all the light that is leaving the flash is polarized and then here is the uh, polarization lens that I use this is from case but you can use whatever just make sure 
that you don't cheap out on this stuff because the cheapest filters they are not very good and they can introduce uh, issues with the sharpness and and other you know all kinds of different artifacts in your images so make sure that you buy some quality stuff and now in order to calibrate this I just use a Christmas ball so I can get some really nice reflections and I'll uh, turn on the light on the flash so you can see now the LED light is turned on there so I can see the reflection and then on the camera I'll just zoom in so oops here you can see the reflection of the light right there and now I'll just rotate this filter until the light disappears you can see it's coming back now again if I rotate like that so this is there's a sweet spot where this filter on the flash is perfectly aligned with the filter on the lens and now it kills all the reflections you will still have reflections though from the table I mean from the tent for example or your environment and if I take a sh uh, take a photo I can obviously still see the reflections of the tent here but you can see when I zoom in here on the flash there's no light it's completely black there's another benefit of doing this and also a downside the benefit is that since you're polarizing the light you're also polarizing the reflections hitting the back of the image uh, I mean uh, the tent so you can see now if I zoom in the back of the tent is completely black so now I don't have to do much at all I can I, I still might have to like drag down the blacks a little bit in the photos but not very much however there is a downside of this as well and that if I flip through the images here now this is unpolarized this is cross polarized you can tell the big difference I have basically killed half of the light and that's because all the lights that is polarized um, in the direction that is opposite to what my lens is, is set to will be killed It's removed it will not get through the lens which means that I in this case have to crank up the ISO a little bit to 200 or I could use a higher strength of the flash but if I go more than to a fourth of power it will not be able to recharge before the next photo is triggering one second after so one fourth is the highest I can go I just want to crop this a little bit and this is what you want to have this is a perfect result and that's where this cow pattern comes in you can see here this one looks amazing this is just great so I like this result we have a nice clean mesh so now we have an unwrapped model on a mesh that has subdivision history which we couldn't do before change the lighting a little bit as well so we get some kind of night scene so anyway here we have our aligned scan it is looking flawless looking really really good so we'll also polygroup these individually which i don't want to have so this is why i use reality capture instead of agisoft now what if you end up with two components when you're aligning your images so here i have one component so now you can see we have a new component here which 192 out of 192 cameras so we have a successful scan looking good this is what we're being scanning today taking the mall into 3 ds max fixing it up and then taking it back to zbrush and then back to reality capture uh, a little bit of tricky but you can see here these amazing nice details we're getting out of this um, so this is a process that I am happy to share with you. So I hope you will like this video.